So um, we've uh, reached um, the panel portion of our program today. And uh, so the way it's going to work is um, we've got um, several representatives uh, from various positions in industry uh, and an academic cellular security researcher. Uh, and we're going to talk about what collaboration could look like between those two, um, those two groups. Uh, and so... Um, I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, so, um, just for reference, let me uh, let me introduce um, our panelists to you. Uh, so, um, you know, you've met our two uh, keynote speakers already, uh, Yong Dae Kim of KAIST, who um, does quite a bit of work on cellular networks, but also does stuff with drones and self-driving cars. Uh, and you've also met David Rogers, um, who's the chair of the GSMA Fraud and Security Group and CEO of Copper Horse. Um, new to the stage today, or uh, bottom, or I don't know what this is, uh, is um, uh, first Roger Brown, from the uh, also from the GSMA, uh, and he's the security services manager um, at GSMA, and uh, he's the person who leads the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Program that was discussed a little bit in the keynote, and he's probably going to talk to us a little more about that. Uh, and uh, finally, we have uh, Yamna Nasser, uh, who is on the Android security team at Google, uh, working on uh, some of their some interesting cellular security stuff that she will tell you about. Uh, and prior to that, she was at the uh, uh, EFF, where she worked on CertBot and Let's Encrypt. Uh, so um, let's have a round of applause to welcome our panelists. So uh, I, I promised our panelists um, that, well, I thought I was going to try to make up a question, but I'm, I'm not. Um, I, I offered them a two-minute soapbox to start with, to, to speak their piece or share whatever they'd like to, sh to share. Uh, and uh, going in alphabetical order, um, let's start with you, Roger. Um, it'd be weird if I'd now just do CBT, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, I, speak your piece. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm here today to sell to you the CBD, or Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Program. Uh, I'm sure many of you in the room do know what it is, but um, for anyone who does not, um, I thought I would um, tell you the benefits uh, of it. Um, firstly, a little bit of history. Um, it was created back in 2017. Uh, uh, previous to that, um, there'd been informal contact between researchers, but people like David and others at the GSMA kicked off an actual formal procedure. Since then, we've had, I believe, 76 cases come to us. Um, and yeah, a lot of work, hard work from our panel on that. And uh, I believe it saved a lot, of, a lot of money to the industry and, and end users as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's, it's quite, um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite certain now we, we've got a, a, a method and we've got a process. There's not been too much change to it now. Um, and yeah, it, it seems to be doing pretty well. And um, we think, um, why am I at YSEC? Well, I think YSEC is like a really nice uh, mixture um, of attendees um, for the panel. It's mainly the, 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 the big two main stakeholders. Um, so we've got you know industry, and they make up our panel uh, of, uh, of experts that assess the research that come in. Um, and then we've got um, the other major stakeholder, which is academia. 70% uh, of the research that we receive comes from universities. Um, so it's great to come out and kind of find out you know, issues with the scheme, uh, things that you want to share with me, because this is the first time I've met panelists and um, the industry and academia. So it's been really useful for me this week. Um, what are the benefits of the panel, of, of the program? So they're up on the screen there. Um, First thing, first thing to say, though, is that the industry um, really recognizes um, the work of the researchers. That, that might not be known, but it really is. You know, we're, we're in contact with the industry, and, and they know how important um, all this research that comes to us is. Um, second point um, to make is that if you bring your research to us, um, it's effectively a single point of contact. Uh, we program manage it effectively. Uh, instead of having to reach out to all of the companies that are affected by your um, vulnerability, um, 
because of our contacts, our address book, essentially, we, we are able to speak to these people directly, um, and that saves a lot of time for, for someone who is into research. Rapid process flow, so 90 days, um, we assess this work. And you get valuable feedback from panels of experts who are in the industry, um, know their stuff, and know how your vulnerability will affect the real world. Um, it, it remains private, which is um, you know, a really big selling point. But if you're wanting to um, release your work at a, an event coming up, and you want a certain date, we can keep that private within the, the panel of 30 until it's, it's ready to go. Um, and then there's the acknowledgement, acknowledgements page at the end, um, which, yeah, you, uh, yeah, which is useful to most people, I think. So that's mm -hmm. CVD. Well, thanks, Roger. Um, next up, uh, so before um, we get to Yamna, who's next up, um, folks, if you have questions for our panel, um, I've got my, I'm watching my email here. Uh, so send them to my email address, and um, as they come in, I'll bring them up to the panel. Um, so uh, Yamna, um, what's your two-minute soapbox? Uh, okay, so I'm here to tell you about the Android cellular security team. So our focus is at-risk users, who, so such as journalists, activists, lawmakers, who have a long history of being subject to cellular attacks. Uh, so I'm going to go in order about talking about some features we've released over the last three years, um, and then tell you sort of like uh, about stuff we have planned for the future um, and how this is relevant to academia. Um, so in 2021, in Android 12, we released the 2G toggle, uh, which, which allows uh, you to disable your phone from connecting uh, over 2G at the hardware level. So prior to this, there were some, some phones that used Android did have 2G toggles on them, but they didn't work by communicating to the modem, like don't use 2G, they did other stuff. So I, they were not as effective. Anyway, so that was a su successful. It's been picked up by a bunch of OEMs. Um, in 2022, we expanded the scope of the Android Vulnerability Rewards Program so that now uh, cellular uh, hardware is in scope. So if you you know, have attacks that target uh, modems, and they affect Android in any way, you can now also submit them to us in addition to also submitting them to the like primary OEM or like modem maker. Um, and yeah, we can help them, we can help the get the issues fixed faster. Um, and we still pay out like pretty high sums of money for them. Um, yeah, so I would encourage you to submit those to us as well. Um, and as an aside, uh, when you are submitting vulnerabilities to us, where you have proof of concept exploits, you must make sure you have tested them with a PLMN that is not 0101 and that they work. Um, and the reason why is because if you use this, uh, many modems go into a test mode and they have behavior that is only triggered with that PLM PLMN. Um, and so, yeah, if it doesn't work for others, then we can't really like give you the reward and the acknowledgement stuff because there's nothing actually to fix. Um, so in 2023, so a few months ago, we supported that in the upcoming Android release, so to be released later this year, um, there will be a new user setting to allow you to disable null ciphered cellular connections. Um, and we gave a talk about that at Real World Crypto in Tokyo a few months ago, if you want to know uh, more about that. Uh, and we also had a blog post uh, detailing our work on enabling memory safety features in bare metal targets that Android runs on. Um, yeah, and we also started a new working group in the GSMA on cellular root of trust that currently has over 60 members. Um, yeah, and we have quite a few new features planned for the 2024 release um, that we're actively working on right now. Um, I can't comment too much on unreleased stuff, but yeah, definitely look forward to next year. Um, and finally, the way that this is mostly relevant to everyone in the room is we are actively looking to fund cellular security research projects. Um, we, you will still be allowed to publish like whatever. Um, we will help you get all the permissions needed from within Google. 
Um, yeah, e my email is on the screen. Email me, yamna at google.com. There is even, there's a paper at this conference we helped fund the work for. Yeah, we have a lot of money and we would like to give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that would make her pretty popular with this crowd. <laughs> um, so, so thanks, Shamna. Uh, next up on the list, we've got Young Day. So, okay. So, do you accept? I already have questions. So do, you, do you accept <laughs> yeah. the standard vulnerabilities too? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. So, design vulnerabilities of the specification. Okay. Good. <laughs> uh, Young Day also has a white paper. He'd like to send you. Okay. I, I'm kidding, <laughs> but I did see him writing it in his head as as you were talking. I mean, I, I, yeah. So whenever I do responsible disclosure, probably to CVD, I will do it to Google as well now. <laughs> All right. So can you can you show my slide? I, I made uh, some academic wish list. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I wish the GSMA to share a list of unsolved problems. And so, for example, like a broadcast uh, uh, cell tower to UE broadcast messages and you know, unprotected messages, and, and there are many, many of them. And I think uh, you, if you can share the list of unsolved problems as well as their current status, including previous uh, rejected proposals, I think it would be very useful for academia to actually come up with some good solutions. And uh, CVD has been doing really good for researchers, but as we discussed uh, today and yesterday, it seems that academia is misunderstanding the meaning of CVD. And I think what we need more is actually design CVE. So in terms of the design, uh, so if there are vulnerabilities and if you can actually talk about, for particular attacks, you can actually talk about CVSS as well, the severity of those attacks. Then, then actually we, you, I think, but yourself, you can actually think about whether each of these vulnerabilities or, or vulnerabilities associated with the, each of the attacks should be actually patched in the design or not, right? So, <coughs> so that's one thing. And I wish we have a UE or network security test bed so that we can remotely test some of those vulnerabilities because, uh, because I mean. In most countries, like testing against a live network is illegal, right? <laughs> and nobody has those infrastructure. I mean, I was actually lucky to have testbed access in all the Korean telcos, but there was only me, and and there are many researchers uh, who need actually those, including some of the memory bugs. I mean, I'm not allowed to test the memory bugs in the <laughs> uh, core network equipment. Uh, but I think someone has to do it, right? And I think one thing we are missing, I, I don't know, I mean, the reference implementation, I mean, in many other network standard, actually reference implementation has been provided. But for, for cellular, the specification is actually very, very difficult to understand and people often misunderstand the specification. So I think what's, what we need is, is actually reference implementation that uh, avoid um, uh, all the misunderstanding. And it seems that actually there are a lot of diversities <laughs> caused by the, actually the missing reference implementation. So that, that's one of my wish list. And I think it'd be good to have actually standardized the detailed security test cases and enforcing of the testing, because it seems that um, more and more bugs are coming. And when I was actually talking to industry after the responsible disclosure, they say, oh, thank you, oh, we'll fix it. But <laughs> so for example, if I report one uh, buffer overflow, right? I mean, suppose I have 10 buffer overflow of the same kind, I just report one, 
but they just report, they just fix only that one, right? They will never want to find other nine, nine of them, right? So, so then, I, I think if we have actually more uh, standardizing the test cases and also enforcing the testing, I think, I think we can have less and less vulnerabilities. Uh, I mean, probably I think allowing network fuzzing, <laughs> live network fuzzing will be actually very uh, difficult. But um, but the last thing is probably, I think clean slate design is actually a very interesting thought. And I think if we can do some, you know, begin talk about actually what should be the ideal clean slate design with academia, and or industry together, I think that would be the ideal, you know, thought process that will, I mean, require us to think about good direction of the cellular security. All right, so that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Zhang Day. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have uh, David. Um. <clears throat> I feel like I've been compelled to answer every one of those points, but um, I'll... Uh, Can I fuzz your network? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a chat up line? <laughs> um, so I, I, I do want to respond to those, actually, but I will get on my soapbox in a positive way about something else, <clears throat> which is about the positive relationship that we've had between academia and industry and also the security research or the hacking community over the past few years and the dividends that we've reaped from it. Um, so I, I'll just give two examples of where I've been directly involved. And the first one is around um, femto cells or small cells. Um, so my speaking as my company here, um, so back in 2012, 2013, there were quite a few uh, publicized hacks. There were uh, some academic papers, there was a lot of uh, hacking research, and there was also some criminal research um, into how best to use femto cells for... <laughs> for uh, lots of nefarious things. Um, and um, what came out of that was uh, that uh, the industry group that was responsible for it, the Femto Forum, actually employed my company uh, to go and essentially write the security requirements and, and fix this problem. And that for me was great because I already knew some of the security researchers involved and um, some of the people that, that, that you guys probably know, people like Ravi Borganker and, and um, a lot of people involved in, um, in sort of cellular research. Um, and because those people had made their work public and highlighted a lot of the issues where, for example, standards weren't being implemented, you know, you're back to your testing thing, that gave me a lot of material and justification to take that to the next level one industry were basically ready to deal with it and, and an evidence base to work from. And if that wasn't there, I wouldn't necessarily have the grounding to sort of mandate as I did. And, and the same um, with some of the public hacks. And we reached one point in that process where one particular operator um, wanted me to remove from the material uh, a particular hack against their piece of equipment. And if you think through the logic of that, you've already got that. <laughs> it's a public-facing piece of material, right, that everybody's already heard about. It's been in the press. And just to save your embarrassment, you want me to remove it from the paper, even though it's, it's really important to, to illustrate the problems and what we need to fix. And um, I did manage to kind of get around that, but it, it kind of showed up how ludicrous that situation was that you know, industry is prepared to sort of hide from itself when everybody else knows these kind of issues. Anyway, so to move on, we got that sorted out and, and uh, um, we did quite well on small cell security after that. The second example is on IoT security. So as I mentioned, um, what is now EN, Etsy EN303645 started out as the UK practice on IoT security. Now, if it wasn't for the security research community in very ways, uh, particular people, particularly people like Bo Woods and Josh Corman from I Am The Cavalry, um, but also all the people who've worked on um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure, going back to Rainforest, going back to um, the work that Kate Missouri did, and lots and lots of other people. Um, I wouldn't have been in a position in a government meeting 
to shoot down the guy that said we shouldn't talk to the hackers when I proposed to put in vulnerability disclosure. And that is the power, the power of the long long-term efforts where people think they're getting nowhere but they do gradually get somewhere so that somebody like me is positioned at that end point to be able to kind of strike the final blow and get it through and now that thing is in law we're the first country in the world to put CVD into law and now that's also bringing um, the Computer Misuse Act into focus as well so it may make it easier for researchers and academics in the future to be able to touch cloud equipment and to touch mobile network equipment. But as I say, that is only because of the efforts of thousands of mobile uh, researchers and academics. And I think that's a really positive thing. So that's, that's my soapbox. That was the warmest and fuzziest soapbox I think I've ever heard. Thank you. Uh, so um, you know, the theme of the, of the panel is collaboration. And um, you know, um, looking at, at Young Day's wish list, um, the theme is 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 really, I think, you know, speaking for other cellular researchers, um, we desperately want to help you more. Um, and so I think a good question for the group is, um, you know, what are what are the barriers or things that we need to fix to make that easier to make that work better? I am asking the panel. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, okay. Uh, uh, somebody needs a mic. Do you want to go for that? Yeah. So, could you put his list back up again? <laughs> um, Do we need an update? <laughs> with that, right. So, so um, yeah, the list of unsolved problems is very, very long and very painful, I think. And some of them are problems in a time frame where there are other dependencies or there are other aspects that, are con that provide context. So I'm not 100% sure that providing that list of unsolved problems necessarily moves the topic forward. But I think in general, opening up questions that we need answers for, especially I, I, I would like to be the future looking person rather than looking back all the time. Uh, um, I, I think that would be very helpful and maybe we could discuss with the GSMA whether that's a sensible thing to do. I think also for standards bodies as well, you know, um, mm. a lot of the questions here also apply to 3GPP and, and many others of the standards bodies around the world. Um, because. Uh, you know, diversification is a big thing at the moment as well in telecom. So perhaps there might be some emergent SME that actually has that idea and didn't realize that it was an industry problem. So so um, the answer is yes, we should probably do it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic. Can um, uh, 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 the reason why I, I said uh, we probably want this rejected proposal is because some people will propose something similar, right? And there are reasons behind all those uh, rejected proposals, but I mean, people don't understand exactly why those proposals were rejected. And actually, I was talking to many of the 3GPP people, and they say, oh, there are multiple reasons for those. Uh, I mean, even in case of the broadcast channel, there are many, many reasons why all, all those records like, digitally signing the broadcast message is rejected, right? Yeah. And there are, you know, pain point where like CGPP and GSMA could not take all those existing, you know, proposal. And, and I think people need to understand those, right? That's, that's what we need to solve mm -hmm. to have actually those solutions included. So that's what I, what I mentioned. Uh, previously rejected proposals or, or some explanation about exactly what what kind of problems need to be solved. Yeah. So I think we, we yeah. maybe <laughs> two of us are using this No, one. no, it's you give me the smaller one. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I get that. And I, I just think that in, in some cases it's very nuanced, right? Um, and um, 
uh, you know, like IMEI, the IMEI one is the same. It's the same issue, and there are multiple proposals, and there there are multiple reasons why that that might be rejected and uh, i think it might be quite difficult to describe those because also you're working you know fuji pp is quite a bubble it's a bubble with a lot of uh um sort of corporate knowledge in terms mm -hmm. of the, the the historical uh knowledge as to why certain architectural decisions were made and why they weren't and actually that's you know same with ietf and w3c they benefit from that corpus of knowledge that's built up over time with those people so so then sort of communicating that outwards to people mm -hmm. might be a bit more difficult to kind of say this decision in 1981 had this yeah. ramification and this and, and that's the reality of it really is it's stuck in a, a group of people's heads um and i don't i don't think it's ideal to be honest with you because i also i mentioned group think earlier is that it can also kind of breed sort of cultish behavior so, you know, people talk about the Silicon Valley mindset, for example, it's the kind of same thing is that everybody's friends with each other. So everybody ends up thinking the same way and they can't think of different ideas. And that, and that is a problem for innovation. Uh, it's also a problem for kind of breaking out and thinking about other alternative viewpoints, um, which actually uh, it, there's a if you ever go in the e, in the UN human rights chamber in Geneva, the ceilings by a Spanish artist and wherever you sit in the chamber it's a different view and the idea is that everybody has a different viewpoint on the same problem and I, th I think there's something to be thinking about when we're, we're looking at standards and, and new technology. Um, so I guess um, my point of view on this is more from the Android side. Uh, so I'm the person who primarily implements uh, most of the cellular security features in Android. And in addition to doing that, I also, like before I do that, I have to go talk to many carriers and many of the hardware OEMs who be like, is this what I want to do? Are, you may, you, there's a button you may be pressing. It, we, I'm to press, the I'm to press, the press it one more time, but not more than one. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, and so we have like a, at this point, pretty like well-oiled pipeline for introducing cellular security features into Android. And, but I think, so something I've noticed is um, people are always sending me papers from academia that are like of the form, Android should do X to fix problem Y. Uh, and problem Y will be like a real serious important problem, but then the solution proposed, like solution X, will be completely detached from reality. Um, like it won't fit in to sort of how like when we're working on Android, like the thing that we release once a year, like it has to be usable by the OEMs who like take it and customize it and like sell those phones to their customers. Um, we can't do things that like break connectivity and mass and stuff. So there's all these considerations we have to think about. Um, so that's just something I wish, like academia was a bit more aware of like what the Android engineering and release process is like. Um, and I've been trying to fix that by like giving more talks or like writing more blog posts, but yeah. So that's like probably my biggest gripe. Where do we find your blog? Well, it's a Google blog. It's like the Google security blog. Are you telling me to just Google it? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I walked into that one. Um, so um, I, I, I'm curious, um, and this may be a, a question for all of our industry folks. Um, are there other examples where, um, you know, so uh, if you make the mistake of reading the comments on Hacker News, Every cellular and telco problem has a very simple solution that that people won't do, and it's because dot 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 money or something. Um, uh, are there are there examples where you know, acad other examples like Yamna is talking about where academics come to you with a solution that's predicated on um, you know, situations that aren't realistic? Or, or just a misunderstanding of the problem space? Well, there is one example, which is false base stations. Tell uh, us more. <laughs> so, 
you hear a lot of reports about false space stations, and you see even academic papers stating definitively that these false space stations were here at this time, blah, blah, blah. It's simply not true. It's not, it doesn't bear, you know, even the basic scrutiny. Um, so I think there are sort of myths that exist within our industry and in academia. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I might be entirely wrong, but I would say that the evidence that we have is that where there have been reports of false base stations and they've been investigated is that actually they weren't false base stations. It was a misunderstanding of the network topology. Where, like, So the classic one is DEFCON, where somebody tweeted out all these false base stations. What it was was the network operator for an extra capacity to deal with, you know, 20,000 hackers in the same space. But a rumor takes hold really quickly. And the next thing you know, you know, all sorts of conspiracy theories. I, I'm sure it made everyone's conference a lot more interesting, though, even if it wasn't uh, true. Well, there's always something, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it, it does frustrate this does frustrate you when things like that happen because these kind of myths take hold and I'm sure it's the same with Android and there's not a lot that you can do to suppress them. Um, during the COVID pandemic, for example, we had to deal with all this nonsense about 5G and coronavirus and all this disinformation <laughs> and people, people actively burning down base stations. Um, now, there's a lot of, we, we have that and the origins of that and you can imagine, you can probably all agree or not, where those origins are as well, and, uh, people deliberately seeding uh, certain stories and putting them together. Um, but there are also a set of people that truly believe that. And if you have a look at some of the videos out, people really need help in some cases. Um, but that, that has a real world impact. And the real world impact was that uh, engineers were being attacked. They, the operators had to ask these engineers to, to have blank uniforms and blank vans and everything. And, um, and some of the base, a couple of the base stations that were burnt down were put in there specifically to add extra capacity for the hospital. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really frustrating when you see that happen. Mm. <laughs> So the fake base station problem is solved or it's still very, I mean, I've heard that it's very widespread in China these days because of the sending phishings and those kind of things, right? So from the fraud and security group perspective. It's not solved because of the legacy problems that we talked about earlier. So the SMS blasters, for example, that are uh, sort of perpetrating those frauds yes they they are popular in certain countries and um it is a problem and i think as, a, as i say that's a sort of symptom of legacy but where what i was referring to was the sort of again cons sort of conspiracy theory stories about particular types of false space station or sort of stinger type activity mm -hmm. in a particular location at a particular time and definitively it was this and actually in a lot of cases it wasn't it was just that, as I say, sort of temporary base stations or, you know, the network changing and so on. Um, but th that won't change some people's minds. They'll believe something else. Mm -hmm. um, so I look at a lot of bugs related to uh, connectivity in Android, and I have seen so many that are like, uh, I was driving down the highway and then suddenly I lost signal. I think that means I was targeted by a fake base station attack. Can you investigate this? <laughs> Yeah, so it is quite a problem. So um, I, I, I have a follow-up question on the, on the fake base station question. So um, you've gotten lots of reports where people have wrongly identified them. Um, and I may be mistaken. If I am, someone in this room will know. Um, I'm not aware of an academic project outside of China that, has, that actually has claimed to find fake base stations in Europe or North America. Um, and and it, that does make me wonder if, if we as academics misunderstand the, the problem, or is it that they just aren't there? Well, I mentioned Ravi Borganka, um, and, and he and a number of other academic researchers have, have looked into this, and also they were instrumental i would say in terms of bringing in this um the suki and supi and um 
and that project, uh, I, I, I can't remember the exact name of it, I want to say impact, but um, one of those EU funded projects was mm -hmm. quite instrumental in changing things. Um, and um, also, you know, some of the work of Carsten and Noll as well, I think, in that space mm -hmm. as well was quite instrumental. But I think it did bring up a lot of false positives again. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, l let's be honest, it, 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 it's very hard to find something that you don't know where it's going to be at any one time and, um, and so on. You could probably... You could probably guess where where some false space stations might be at a certain time, but it's mm -hmm. very difficult to prove. Mm -hmm. There are other there are other ways I would say of going after that problem, mm. and that, and again I think that's in the message from academics here is think of, think about other ways of approaching of approaching your research not purely from the technical end. Um, so uh, you might in my work tackling embedded systems hacking, looking up the food chain, looking up the food chain of the hacking community, and then looking at, for example, who's reselling car hacking equipment, for example, and you just start to uncover this whole world of stuff. And then you can buy it, yeah, eth ethically, of course, uh, but you can buy it and you can reverse engineer it and you can start to understand what's really going on on the ground. And actually there's a hell of a lot of innovation going on. <laughs> So David actually recommended me to buy a uh, fake base station from Alibaba and do the testing. So academia, <laughs> academia please start <laughs> buying some equipments from the... <laughs> well, well, Alibaba, you have to buy in bulk. So if you want to make a bulk order, meet me up here after... 10,000 full space stations. Um, <laughs> oh, really? So you should only buy the bulk? I, 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 I mean, I don't think you can buy less than 100 of anything on Alibaba. Um, I'm, it, I'm, it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, but that, that, that also drives the coach and horses through um, a lot of sort of vendor fud that you see about the dark web, right? Most of the stuff that I'm after is openly advertised. They might use a, a few sort of code words in terms of like the way that they want to mm -hmm. describe it just so they don't get arrested. But it's all there openly sold and you just need to try and just work your way down the rabbit hole slowly and then a world of wonderment awakes you <laughs> at Alibaba. <laughs> so um, maybe to shift gears a little bit, um, uh, we've gotten a, a couple of questions about um, there's the standards and then there's the implementation. And a lot of times um, when a vulnerability is discovered, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, and sometimes it's an unlucky combination of both. Uh, and so one question we got from uh, Zhe Yu Chao um, is, um, you know, on this, you know, on the um, you know, response side of things, how do you disentangle who is responsible for what and um, and uh, you know, is it a cooperative arrangement or is it a, a not my problem situation? Um, <laughs> um, oh, well, we rely heavily on the 30 experts that we have on a panel really um, and they're often embedded within uh, 3GPP as well um, they, they, they work on both sides so it, it, yeah, it's relying on on the knowledge base of of those thirty experts, and they're across the industry, you know, operators, um, vendors, uh, and all all elements of security. Really, yeah, there's a discussion uh, and it's evaluated, and then we take the route. Um, we might talk to the vendors as well if they're suggested as being affected by. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's not it's not so much a blame game as um, the you know, the CVD panel says, okay, these people need to know about this problem to fix, and these people. So you're able to disambiguate it or or to divide it technically, or or you know organizationally, um, and so it's there's not a so it's not a situation where everybody is fighting trying to get the other person to do something. No, I think yeah, it works quite. Quite well, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, that's um, 
That's, you know, that's delightful to hear. Yeah. We get so little good news. Um, <laughs> something <laughs> works at least. Um, but it does, it does work very well, actually, isn't it? And, and um, I think the, there are cases where, for example, an issue is reported as an industry-wide issue. And actually, you know, the, 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 essentially the terms of reference of the CVD panel is on industry-wide issues. It's not on vendor-specific issues. So if mm -hmm. it's recognized as a vendor-specific issue, we would redirect them. And we would facilitate that as well and say, look, you know, here's where you need to go to. But then step away at the point, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, but um, yeah, Industry-wide, yeah, it's, it's a bit easier to deal with, isn't it, in that, in that sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've seen the same things with... Um, like some of the hardware vulnerabilities, like the ones that um, Intel had to deal with in terms of, um, you know, it took 18 month hardware fixes and mm -hmm. there was a, a sort of consortium of companies that were affected essentially. And um, Are you referring to the Spectre meltdown side channel issue or, or, is there, or are you talking about something cellular well, specific? Primarily Spectre and meltdown, obviously, but there have been other issues as well. And um, I think those sort of, very deep vulnerabilities where it requires a lot of collaboration and cooperation. I think we might see more of those in the future. I think that's the big anxiety that a lot of people have. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. So, so one, uh, I want to talk about that uh, misunderstanding of the specification. And so it seems that. I mean, when we do even responsible disclosure, sometimes we fight with the vendor. I mean, they 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 misunderstand. And basically, I I actually consult with the three GPP people, and okay, what's the meaning of this sentence? And we do have a long discussion, and then we do responsible disclosure to that that company, and they say no, it's not. And, they, and so so I think really either. It would be good to have some formal language representation of the standard or, or you know, full, you know, uh, mm -hmm. state machine representation, like gold state machine or some reference documentation would be very, very beneficial for everyone. But uh, did GSMA consider any of those, like, reference implementation or causing avoiding uh, misunderstanding. So, I mean, actually, I've heard that some some of the 3 people say that you should not try to find vulnerability unless you understand the standard. <laughs> Does anyone understand the standards? Um. Um, so, I have noticed there are some GSMA reference implementations. Um, for like the cryptographic stuff. So it's just like a page with some C and or C++ on it. And then it says at the bottom, like if you use this, send, send us a check for $2,000. So like, yeah, it would be cool to Young Day's point, like if there was more reference implementations. So maybe a, a question for the panel. Um, it, along the lines of Young Day's um, reference implementation, um, it seems that with 5G, there's um, been a lot of talk about um, open source code, for example. Um, and could could that actually be a solution, or is it its own problem? Yeah, there's a number of standards bodies that have looked at code first standards, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we've got a lot of formal methods people in the room as well. Like, um, it would be interesting, wouldn't it, if we were able to. Uh, remove non-deterministic elements of uh, standards uh, and and describe it in a way that's both human readable but also provable. Um, but but on the code first thing, there are, as I mentioned, there are a number of uh, different different efforts. There's there's one from um, GSMA around the operator platform group that they're doing some work. Uh, there's also um, efforts in W3C as well. Uh, and also ITU, I think, as well, have been looking at this. Um, I, I, th I think it, it is likely to happen. Um, and it also, I think, will usher in a new generation of contributors. Um, I think there seems to be a tension between old-style 
creation of standards and requirements documents and endless debates over shall should should not mm -hmm. must why and the, and this sort of basically a dictionary that you you can should shall not use um that feels to me like machine automation as well um so i think it i think it's going to evolve into into this but then you start to get into languages and compilers and issues there of implementation or the the reference implementation is insecure or that there's somebody tailored it or there's submarine ipr in it or you know and all this like other things that come back to the other standards problems again so i'm, I'm thinking uh, go, ahead. go ahead what about the testing security testing <laughs> okay, I'll try and lay this up as a question for the other panelists as well. Um, so, so in the security testing that we have existing for mobile network equipment, so uh, we already have a set of uh, test specifications. Very high level. Discussion. Very high level, yeah. And I think what's going to happen, so you mentioned about testing laboratories so in the uk for example we are setting up something the uk tl the uk testing laboratory which mobile network operators will be able to come to mobile network equipment vendors will be able to put their kit into and basically there'll be a kind of range that people can test stuff out on which would be great for security researchers and for academics um, i think Surrey's going to be involved in it and um so then it may force open that issue of the fact that the, the, the what are called the SCSIs for 3GPP are maybe not, I'll go further and say, not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, my skeptical view, and I don't know what the others think, is that no set of test cases is going to cover everything that you require. And um, I, I, yeah, so I'm skeptical as to whether we solve the problem that way. Hmm. I don't know what you guys think. So um, I've, I've got a question for Yamna along that front. I'm, I'm wondering if um, what what you think about security testing in the context of cellular and Android. Um, is, is that, you know, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, so I feel like I don't have a lot of opinion did it stop working? Okay, no. Uh, because I feel like a lot of when people do that, they are targeting the modems. Uh, so even though we do like pay out for vulnerabilities in the modem that affect Android in any way, um, yeah, it, I don't have any like Android specific thoughts about that. Okay, so Android is is far enough isolated from the modem stack, which is really, I think, what what Yongde was referring to. So some some of the interesting example was in 2019 when we worked on the LTE fuzz. So in the specification it says the play attack should be prevented. Okay, <laughs> and so we were not sure whether the vendors are capable of implementing the prevention of a protein. So we just send the replay, and it worked. <laughs> and who should be in charge of like a testing replay tech protection is, right? And, and there are, I mean, many, so the, the application leave many of those implementation details to vendors, right? And the vendors don't follow, or, or they are not capable of Right. So, so that's yeah. And I think this is the problem of um, not laziness, but I think there's someone else's problem. Um, I mean, for example, when we try to ban default passwords, yeah. um, it's kind of everybody knows what the problem space is, right? And they know 
that this is about user interfaces and that you shouldn't use admin admin. They also know it's about exposed um, ports and exposed protocols where the authentication is you know, a default username and password. They also know that that's primarily where a lot of the threats come from, so we need to get rid of it. But then you come down to the test specification and we have to explicitly say, you shall not use sequences of numbers. You shall not use a symmetric key base. And, and you go through and you have to exhaustively tell people that you, you're not exhoring it. You're not using a Caesar shift cipher. When most security professionals would kind of know that by default and that they wouldn't, they wouldn't go down that road. But so the test spec ends up being a hundred times longer than the actual requirement. And I think this is a problem actually that humans will find difficult to solve. And maybe, maybe we'll have the technology in the future to be able to exhaustively. So kind of like your structured fuzzing that we were talking about earlier, that um, we can exhaustively build the test cases around the language of the requirement. So when you're saying no replay attacks, that means on every single interface, on an every single protocol, and in every single circumstance. And then you can run that through, say, a digital twin, or you run it through, uh, you know, this kind of test lab. But to have people writing those is going to screw up, right? Because people are lazy and the people get tired and all the rest of it. That, that's just my personal view on it. So I, I have a feeling that if Google were to implement a stack, they would not need a 500-page test strategy to know not to use XOR as crypto. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if that speaks to, you know, some sort of skill or capability um, deficit on the part of the vendors, manufacturers, whatever term you want to use. Um, and if so, um, so first, would, would folks agree with that? And if so, um, you know, you've got a room full of people who teach for a living. Um, maybe, maybe there's something we could do about it. So I have the impression that a lot of the people doing this implementation work, uh, not just in the context of Android and the modem makers, modem vendors, whatever, um, but also like in general, like the software engineering community, they don't really think about security stuff. Um, and if there isn't someone in a role who works adjacent to the software engineers, who's like a security engineer reviewing their work or like approving like things they want to add into whatever software product they work on, often a lot of this stuff gets miss missed. So it's just like you need, they, they need to be working in partnership yeah, with someone who's responsible for helping them with that part of the engineering process. I mean, a hundred percent agree that we, we need uh, structural education before other events that, um, you know, like if you're, if you're training to be an engineer, the safety module, the health and safety module is a mandatory part, whether, whether you're doing an HNC or, or a higher level degree, if you're doing engineering, you have to understand health and safety. So, so, but we don't have that equivalent for cybersecurity and obviously mm -hmm. it's a, such a broad topic. I know that's difficult, but there are structural issues. Um, but, uh, I, I, I kind of, I also think that we've got so many structural issues when it comes to, for example, programming languages and, um, the bear traps that we set ourselves, um, you, you know, that you can't blame, even when an engineer is trying to do something right they can end up in a dangerous situation when it comes to memory handling or whatever. And that code will still compile and it'll still look okay. And nobody will find that issue. Um, well, the industry should just switch to Rust. Well, that's one route. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> that's um, my mitigation yeah, I mean, section for but, whatever paper I'm writing now. But isn't, isn't this like also the journey that we're on? So I, I was going to use like, building analogy but I, I won't you all kind of know what i mean right is that mm -hmm. gradually we learn what, what how to get better and we can spend our all our lives beating ourselves up and going like we're we're horrible we're, we're bad we're bad <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah we are but um 
it will get better, <laughs> but in this time frame, um, we do have buggy tools and we do have to still keep using embedded C and, and all the rest of it. And we'll just have to cope with that. Mm -hmm. But let's, you know, build the future for our successors to build things that are more safety resilient and so on. Um, but until then, we're reliant on responsible companies like Google to, to help lead the way. Mm -hmm. And, and and I think the work they've done over the past 15 years has been absolutely fantastic, to be honest, particularly in the mobile space. And we need more leaders like that in industry because we are lacking them. And, and on the education side, Google have launched a cybersecurity education uh, portal and some universities are doing that as well. And I think all of that combined helps to solve these issues. Can I? So, so another issue or another trend I see is that many of the standard now says implementation is mandatory, but use is optional. So this is actually very, very, um, I see many, many of those cases. So implementation is actually, um, so Samsung Qualcomm needs to implement uh, some features like UPIP, right? Omnink uh, full rate integration. And actually, the UPIP standard is actually very, very interesting because uh, I think I can say right, that the, so Deutsche Telekom actually proposed to patch the UPIP with the David Ruppert, right? And they actually push a lot because initially Qualcomm and Samsung was actually, I don't know if I say this, <laughs> but anyway, so, so some, some device vendors were against the UPIP implementation because because uh, it was too expensive, right? But actually, the carriers actually pushed it, right? So and and implementation was mandatory, so so they had to implement it. But after the implementation is over, nobody is using it because use is optional, right? And I see many of those uh, as a kind of trend. And um, I, I, I don't know what to say because uh, I see, I mean, good options are available, but because those options are expensive, maybe uh, the carrier is not using it. Mm -hmm. I want to <laughs> look over these cases. Um, I, think, I think we could talk about those cases for a very long time. Uh, we do have a question from from the audience. Um, so um, one more before yours. Um, so um, uh, Kevin Butler asked. Um, uh, you know, he mentioned that um, AOSP was revolutionary for the security community. Uh, there's a reason why there were a thousand and one Android papers written over the last decade, and it's because it was a resource that academics could actually look at, use fix. Um, what would it take to do that with a baseband? Awesome. Huh? I agree. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, I can't say whether that is something like someone is or is not working on. I think it would be really, really hard. Um, it is something I'm personally like very interested in seeing exist one day. Um, yeah, something I would wonder about if there was, I think one major issue that I foresee is uh, doing that in an open source manner is my understanding um, and I have a very loose understanding of this is there are a lot of like issues with patents with radio stuff and somehow that would need to be sorted out. Um, yeah, maybe some of you know more about this. That's also my understanding, I think. Um, so Google stop at the real, right? You have the radio interface layer and that's it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can also see the security reasons for not doing that as well, um, because we're talking about licensed networks and 
there is a large community of people out there that would love to basically set up, you know, their own peer to peer networks and free telephony for everyone. Right. Um, so that would kind of amp that up in a big way. So I can maybe understand why, why the people would be reluctant to do that. Um, but on the AOS thing, um, I would also say that it's ushered in a, a new era of, uh, counterfeit devices, uh, that have scaled up quickly. And what we see there is a lot of insecurity. So I'm looking through my company, looking at um, AOS space head units at the moment. Loads of vulnerabilities that never get patched. They have to sideload, you know, hooky versions of whatever app it is. So often there's malware there. And so a great deal, and this is no criticism of Google, it's just a side effect of it. Um, but there's very little visibility of what's going on there. And I think. Um, potentially in the future that might expose people to, to harm um, where these things are put into safety critical scenarios. Um, so I don't know how that's going to pan out, but it's just a direction of travel that I'm starting to observe and people will buy, you know, even in the UK, they'll see a cheap Android head unit for their car that has all these fantastic features like TV and everything. And they still think it's Android. My own personal view on this is that maybe Android ha should brand rebrand AOS with something else, but that wouldn't necessarily stop those counterfeit vendors selling it as Android. But I do, I do think it would allow Google to kind of take one step back from that sort of counterfeit community uh, and not be seen as equivalent, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think it's a sort of branding issue for Google there. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mark, you had a question? So, yeah, I mean, this is for the GSMA folks. The question is, like, I wanted to understand the dynamics of 3GPP, the vendors, uh, like uh, the baseband processor uh, developers, the telcos, and GSMA. Like, what is that interaction look like? What are the goals of the different parties? Do they overlap? Mm -hmm. So do you want to know the process of when a CVD comes in and how it all Connects or? or in, in general, like say for instance, okay, let's take an example of a, a CD uh, that comes to you, land in your uh, land, which yep. is a design problem. I mean, there is no easy patch. It's not the uh, telco didn't implement something. The design has a flaw. Mm -hmm. Now, how would that interaction go? Well, there'd be the assessment made by the the 30 experts, um, as I say, many of the, which are involved in 3GPP, so they know whether um, there's a standard that could be updated um, to fix the problem or remediate it. Um, an assessment will be made whether it will be passed in 3GPP, because quite often people in the panel will look at it and say it's an issue, but it's... 3GPP will look at it and say it's safe enough as it is, uh, and a lot of money would be spent um, changing things. Um, so there's that, there's that whole assessment, and if they do think it's um, something that they can re remedy, they will you will write an LS to um, 3GPP. A liaison statement. Yeah, sorry, a liaison, liaison statement. Um, if 3GPP agree with that, they'll update their standards and we'll let all of our members know, including the vendors and the operators. Um, so that's how it kind of all connects. Is that, is that what you're looking for or not quite? <laughs> for instance, uh, the vendors, so what is the role of GSMA in place? Right? Uh, because it seems the directives are coming from 3 gpp So can GSMA unilaterally say, like, folks, you should implement this? Or it has to come from 3 gpp Yeah, we, we, we assess it. We give our opinion, but at the end of the day, 3GPP can, yeah, could say no. Um, we, 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 we make suggestions, basically, I think, is, is what we normally yeah, do. Yeah, I mean, the CVD case, obviously, a lot of the stuff ends up where it's cross-industry. It becomes a standards issue, so it's in their court then. And probably, in some cases, it should have gone straight to 3GPP through their program. Mm. Um, but in general, the dynamic, I mean... Um, Obviously, a lot of the companies are exactly the same. So the way that I mentally divide it is we're dealing with this stuff when it's actually implemented and operational. So we deal with the issues as they emerge that where 
where there might be a misunderstanding of the standard or where um, we're seeing security issues happen straight away. Um, and so then that is also fed back into 3GPP or we might be looking at new requirements, you know, for example, you know, there's a rise in mobile phone theft, for example, and we want to try to deal with the IMEI again. And, and so um, companies will work together to, for example, create recommendations and then that recommendation might be read by 3GPP or um, these standards bodies, they all work by liaison statement. So I guess that kind of bounds the, because um, a lot of this is all wrapped up with IPR and things like that as well, but it bounds the problem space to a thing. It also creates a lot of latency in the process, and it really frustrates me, to be honest with you, because the it's quite archaic. You send a liaison statement to a committee that could have been sent in an email, but it's agreed by consensus, so it's a statement of the group. So I kind of get that. It's not one person sending it. But then you have to wait for that next meeting of that organization. And then if in flight that misses the other meeting, then something might not get seen for a year or something. And it might be like an urgent issue. I just think it's ridiculous. So I, I prefer emails all the time, <laughs> chair to chair email or something like that. Um, but yeah, generally, because I think a lot of these individuals are working together on a personal basis as well. I think that's how a lot of problems and challenges get solved in all of these groups is, and this is what we noticed during COVID actually, uh, all the virtual meetings are a nightmare. It's a lot of really difficult problems get solved at the coffee table or, you know, afterwards at the dinner or something. Because, you know, these are human beings, they're individuals and they are thinking about this and they're thinking, oh, what's the best? And they're bouncing ideas off each and that collaborative working is where the real, the real problems are solved. And um, and again, if those same people are involved in different initiatives like GSMA or IETF or W3C or whatever, um, that's that that sort of collaborative pooling of uh, knowledge um, is how things get done. Is that right? So as long as I know, many of our papers are discussed in 3GPP. Mm -hmm. So they, you can actually look at, so when you look at some of those uh, proposals, actually, when you go through it, they actually cite our papers and actually talk about it. Some papers got lightly discussed. Some papers got, you know, more deeply discussed. I, I am familiar with that process. I just wanted to understand mm -hmm. GSMA fellow in the whole process. I, I think even in case of the UPIP, I think because of the three papers from the David Rupreft kind of pushed uh, many of the carriers get mm -hmm. approval that I think this one should be solved, isn't it? Um, the, an the answer is I don't know on that particular okay. issue. I don't know if you know, Roger, but, um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, I mean... Um, having a common understanding of the problem space before you go into a standards meeting is also quite useful as well. So I guess in, in some of these sort of free standards organizations, that's what happens as well, is that a lot of the ideas like get flushed out and, and they get a common understanding, so almost on a requirements engineering basis of what they think is, uh, you know, the problem space and the solution and then that moves into the standard space so there's kind of like no sort of commitment at that stage but it's a it's a discussion forum it's um ideas and so on and then obviously from my point of view it's these guys are operationally dealing with this stuff so the frauds that happen the security issues that happen and then stuff that needs then to be standardized as a result of that so um in the interest of time i have one last question um, and it's for the whole panel. Um, there are a lot of uh, students in, in the audience, folks looking for, for problems, looking to get into new areas. Um, any advice for folks who are new but interested in cellular? Uh, bring your stuff to uh, CVD when, when you get it. That's my, my advice. Because of the amount of good feedback you get from, um, from the panel, advice, I think it's really useful to someone coming into it. Uh, I'd highly recommend bringing your stuff to the CBD panel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big sell at the end. <laughs> yeah. 
um, I'll, I'll open an invite. So I've, I've mentioned to a couple of people who told me about interesting research. So, we, you know, we, we're not the Oracle and we, we don't know everything that goes on. So uh, if you think you've got interesting research in the mobile telecom space, or so somebody talked to me about smishing earlier, um, we do want to hear about it and we have the opportunity to present at our meetings. Um, so we have a device security and architecture group meeting in San Ramon uh, coming up in the first week of August um, hosted by AT&T. And often at those th that particular meeting we have pre-sees of the Black Hat and DEF CON presentations. Um, but a lot of the presentations are academic and you'll be able to present to an industry audience and um, th they'll be very receptive to it. So, if, um, so please feel free to email me um, and, you know, you're welcome at any of our meetings to present. Um, you just have to convince the, the committee that decides on, on the presentations that, that it's, uh, it's something interesting. It's an end, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that, the, <laughs> so if, if someone wanted to do that, uh, what? Who should they contact? Um, well, they can contact Roger. They can contact me. Um, they can also contact um, file a CVD. Uh, yeah, try not to do that address. But there is security at gsm gsma.com, uh, fasg at gsma.com. Uh, so you can go in that way and just explain, you know, that you'd like to speak at one of our events, and then it'll eventually get back to us. Mm -hmm. um, but we are very, very open to to talking to academics and understanding your research and um, and listening to you. Mm -hmm. uh, is that fair? So my recommendation is to think about new exploitation of existing vulnerabilities. Because I think existing vulnerabilities are getting forgotten mm -hmm. because uh, no new attacks, no new practical attacks appear. So probably when new attacks appear, I think those issues may re-arise and may be discussed in the GSMA and 3GPP. And I mean, when we try to work on the physical localization, I think there are like, you know, uh, what was it? The transmission TPC, so TP transmission power control, or, you know, making uh, some IDs not changing. Like, like those new, um, I mean, when you think about applications and, and there are, all features, some of those could be actually useful for actually developing those applications. So, my recommendation is, you know, working on those, like the new exploitations of the existing vulnerabilities. Thanks, Yamna. So, once again, uh, my point of view is more from someone who does the implementation work. But prior to doing this, I did come from academia. So, and maybe some of you will find yourselves in a role similar to me one day. Uh, so I think the one thing I would say is uh, don't give into feelings about how overwhelmingly broken a lot of stuff in cellular is. Uh, when I first started out in this field, I heard from many people in many directions who I went to for advice. And their advice was, don't even bother trying. Like, you will never be able to accomplish anything. Everything will be broken forever. And luckily, I did not listen to those people. Um, and yeah, so like, make sure you find people who will support you while still giving you honest feedback when you need it. And yeah, don't give in to those feelings of hopelessness or apathy, especially if you end up in a position like doing security consulting work or implementation work, because um, it's very important. Thanks. I was just going to say, even if you've not got a CBD, you can reach out to us with questions. We've, we've had plenty of questions from academia that the panel have helped us with. So yeah. Make, make use of us, basically. Fantastic. Well, let's thank our panelists.